Perfect. All right. Thanks, everyone, so much for being here again. Round three, Faith Reason, uh, and the session today being our second on faith and science, in particular questions in biology and cosmology. So nice, big, fun words here. Uh, but before we get into that, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, source of all wisdom and knowledge, we ask that you might bless us in our time here. Allow us to understand the mysteries of your creation. Allow us to understand the reason and the nature that you have put into all things, that we might draw nearer to you through it. And Blessed Virgin Mary, we ask for your prayer and intercession in all of this as well, as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, as I mentioned, this is our third of eight sessions. Uh, before I forget, hopefully I'll remember at the end, since next week is Labor Day, we will not be having apologetics next week. We'll go two weeks from now. We'll be our next one. So, just an FYI to all of you, we will be taking the week off. But getting into this. Faith and Science, Part 2, Questions in Biology and Cosmology. Do a quick review of last section. Last session. Uh, so let's wind back the clock a week. What did we discuss? As a general rule, the church and science have a, had a fairly positive relationship, specific problematic occurrences notwithstanding. Second, what often stands as the received wisdom on the issue really has actually kind of become more of a myth, a legend, instead of real history. It's taken on a life of its own and has become detached from what actually went on in that time, in those places. Third, the charge that the Dark Ages somehow killed science has been poorly substantiated and is rejected by most prominent historians of science. They just don't find it a terribly credible idea. And then finally, the Christian worldview might even have been a major factor in providing the sort of conceptual apparatus, the framework, the base, whereby empirical study of the world even made sense. Because other worldviews, you know, the world might be identified with divinity or it could be alive or it wasn't intelligible. You're not going to do science in any of those scenarios. So, at least as a historical matter, the church and science have generally been on pretty good terms. So today, what's the general thrust of our case? This is a guy named Alvin Plantinga, great philosopher. Uh, yeah, pretty funny guy too. So the basic thesis of our case today, and it's summarized by him, there is superficial conflict but deep concord between science and theistic religion, but superficial concord and deep conflict between science and naturalism. Naturalism just being that, you no. Know, there's no God, the, the natural world is all that there is, stuff like that. So this can be seen in a couple of particular disciplines we're going to focus on, namely the biological science and then physics, especially cosmology, you know, which studies you know, space, its properties, its, you know, expansion, contraction, etc., stuff like that. So we'll be getting into those things. All that being said, an important, a very important warning and caveat this is all going to be incredibly surface level. Like, I am giving one slide a piece to topics people can study for their entire lifetime. This is a survey of ideas and arguments, not a definitive treatment. It is the first word, not the last word. So just understand that we're kind of doing a 30,000 foot view here, and we're going to be running over some of the, the finer details and disputes surrounding these arguments. This is just to kind of give you an initial picture and snapshot. So what are some of the alleged or superficial conflicts we'd find in biology? We'll list three here. First of all, the basic standard one, does evolution conflict with the Christian account of creation? This is probably the most often alleged issue, at least the one that's most prominently covered, and so we'll get into that briefly. Second, there's this branch called evolutionary psychology, 
and it can sometimes be used to sort of explain away man's religiosity, kind of dissolve him. You know, where, where does religion come from? Well, it's just something that arose in our brains from you know, evolutionary processes. It's not actually God trying to communicate with us. And then third, probably the most technical, uh, polygenism is conflicting with descent from Adam and Eve. And so polygenism as opposed to what's called monogenism. Basically, do we all descend from a particular pair of human beings, Adam and Eve, or do we not all descend from that pair? Uh, so we'll deal with that as well. So first and foremost, do evolution and Christianity conflict? As I mentioned previously, we're running very roughly over this. I am devoting one slide to this topic. So just be aware there is much more that can be said. But how, basically, how should we understand the Genesis account of creation, right? As, as we read it, do we, is it just some merely literary work that has no connection at any, to anything at all? Is it a historical or scientific work? Is it some kind of fusion of the two? How do we understand it? And how we answer that question of how we understand Genesis, our origin account, that will sort of help determine our answer to the particular question of the conflict between evolution and Christianity. Right off the bat, though, the church permits varied different understandings about how evolution and Christianity come together. It hasn't really staked out many definitive positions on, on the matter, and so you're free to believe a variety of things. There are some areas you can't go into, right? Um, but the church hasn't said there's one clear and definitive way to go about this, and all others are false. It's simply not the way it's gone about things. Um, I'd like to give one suggestion, though, to say that maybe Genesis isn't intended to be a literal scientific history. And this is Connor's thought. This is not definitive church teaching. But on the days of creation, it speaks of how on the first day, God created light. He separated the light from the dark. Uh, so light came about the first day. But it's not until the fourth day of creation that we get the celestial bodies. The sun, the stars, the moon, all these things. And so then the question arises, okay, well, we know what a day is. They know what a day is. A day is you know, one, one revolution of the sun, right? Or no, I guess one rotation of the earth now is now what we know. But it's the sun going across the sky, and then it's dark. That's one day. Uh, if there was no sun until the fourth day, and then it's describing the first three days as days, maybe it's using a little bit of an allegorical, mythical component, which isn't to say it's all false, but it's, there's, a certain, there's a certain literary device being used here where it's not actually saying, like, this is the actual historical scientific account, because it, it would end up making no sense, right? How can you have days before there's a sun, moon, stars? So that might be something to consider in trying to figure out, okay, may, maybe Genesis isn't giving us what we would find in a science textbook in terms of a description of what's going on. Um, and so that can give us a little bit of leeway in trying to figure out exactly what's intended, exactly what's meant. Just a suggestion. What evidence might there be for evolution? Um, so there's a variety of things. If you look at fossils, fossils, you now they're, they're basically remnants of long dead creatures, and they're buried in varied levels of Earth, and they just go, they go deeper and deeper. The deeper you go, the older they get. And what's been found is that the older fossils, the deeper fossils, are a lot more simple. They're, they're not very complex. And only as you get higher and as you get later in the fossil record, you get more varied life. And so it sort of it seems to indicate that they, you know, there was a small concentration of certain life forms earlier on, and then it expanded into a wider and wider group. So that would be that would be one reason. Um, there are also various reasons in like molecular biology, genetics, for you know, showing how some organisms might have inherited traits 
from previous ones, and which again seems indicative of evolution. Again, this is very cursory, not meant to be a knockdown case, um, but that's that's some of that's some of why, you know, something evolution might be true. So let's say we grant evolution. Let's say that it happened. It took you know millions, billions of years, however long, uh, and now we find ourselves here. How can we approach that as Christians? One of the ways that you know, the church has, begun, has thought about for many years, hundreds, thousands of years, about how God interacts with the world is that he operates through what we call secondary causes. It's a technical term. The basic premise is this. Uh, God is not directly interacting with and poking at, say, you know, molecules, pushing them together to arrange them to be more complex or something like that. It's not a direct action. What happens instead is that he providentially orders the world such that natural causes bring about natural effects, but it's all because he's planned it out that way, and it's because he's sort of he's using these natural effects as instruments, as as like tools to bring things about, rather than directly bringing them about. So there's there's an intermediary he's using, and what this actually does is it gives creation the sort of the the benefit of actually being creative. Um, God didn't just create something that he constantly has to tinker with to make work. Rather, he made something that's organic and is able to sort of run, not completely independently and on its own, because he's constantly having to sustain it at all times, um, but where it can, it can have its own way of doing things that doesn't require constant intervention by God. So, that might be a way of thinking how, how evolution might be compatible with Christianity. God is using long-term natural causes to bring about his desired effect. He's using these secondary causes, these instruments, rather than directly making them happen, and again, constantly tinkering in order to make it work. So what's the end game here? Either evolution turns out to be false, and it's a non-issue, or... Evolution is true, but as we've seen above, there isn't any substantial conflict, right? If we, if we see Genesis as being able to you know, have some, some mythical elements that can accommodate a long-term creation account and God being able to act through you know, evolutionary processes, then science, evolution, don't, they don't conflict with Christianity in this regard. So... That would be my suggestion to you, that there really isn't much of a conflict there unless we manufacture one ourselves. Moving on. Evolutionary psychology. Does it dissolve man in religion? So what's the claim here? The claim is basically that religion arose as a natural phenomenon due to the evolution of the human brain or mind. Uh, it may have served some purpose, such as you know, group cohesion, you know, giving people meaning, whatever thus making it evolutionarily advantageous. And so it arises through evol evolution because it's helpful, supposedly. Or maybe it could have been a spandrel, which is just, it's a non-adaptive side effect. It's just something that comes along within, some, within adaptation, which, and it comes along with such complex minds, brains, things like that. Um, so I mean, if we grant this, and it seems like, okay, religion isn't, you know, Either man search for God, God search for man. Rather, it's just something in our brain that happens because evolution has dictated that it be so, which doesn't seem to be very friendly toward the Christian faith. But there's another way we can read this, right? Man is a homo religionis, a, a, a human, of a religious human. Like, religion is just sort of ingrained in us. Uh, and man is a this creature who's created by God with a sense for and a desire to seek out the divine. God even might have allowed for this to develop in us through a providentially guided evolutionary process. Again, look reverse at the last slide. Um, but the basic point here is this data, it fits both Christianity, theism, and it fits naturalism equally well. And so it can't serve as evidence against Christianity in favor of naturalism. Both, both worldviews can account for what we observe here. And so it can't then weigh one against the other. Long story short, 
evolutionary psychology can't be used to explain away religion. Um, because, again, the Christian worldview can account for the very same facts. All right. This might be one of the most technical parts of the presentation. I'll try to make it not horribly painful. Uh, regardless of your stance on the literary nature of Genesis, the passing on of original sin from one generation to the next is dogmatic teaching. We cannot get rid of it. Um, Pope Pius XII, I believe, wrote this encyclical called Humani Generis, which, which is directly dealing with this issue. Uh, so that means there has to have been some first parents who sinned first and passed on original sin to their offspring. Yet, we can say that, and we can say that all of huma humanity fell under this curse of original sin. However, there's this branch of biology called population genetics, which is basically able to show, like, okay, given the diversity of genes we see today, they can sort of trace it back and say, yeah, there were never fewer than sort of 10,000 humans at any given time in history. Um, so how can there be only two if there were never less than 10,000? That's basically the claim, the concern, the worry. Um, and, and this is a somewhat thorny issue that we don't have a very clear re no, resolution to, in, in part just because, again, we weren't there at the time. We don't have a very clear picture. I will propose to you one theory. This is not the only theory, and it's not an entire, it's not a perfectly likable theory in some ways, but we'll get into it. One theory is that basically there were evolved biological humans who did not yet have a rational soul. So we speak of being made in the image of God, it means we're able to, to reason, to have free will. I mean, we can do things that other animals can't, right? They're not building computers, they're not, they don't have language like we do. And so there's something that sets human beings apart. Um, and so the speculation here is that, okay, maybe humans evolved just as animals, you know, sort of like, like apes growing into humans, where there would be someone like us walking around, but they'd be more animal-like. They wouldn't have full reason, full will, and it's only when God infused a rational soul like we have into that creature that it became a true human being. And so basically it trades on a distinction here between what is a biological human being, which the sciences you know, figure, discuss, which genetics traces, and then what we might call a, a metaphysical or a spiritual human being, one that has an immortal soul, a soul like ours, and is able to live and act like we do. And so say Adam and Eve were the first two people that God put these souls into, these rational human souls, where there were other human-like creatures around, but these were the first two to be given our, like the human spirit, the human spiritual soul. Then all of those born from them, and then from their descendants and offspring, would also have these souls. The part where it gets a little bit tricky is then, eventually, I mean, you're going to need some, some mating, some offspring, where there's a rational human with an animal human pairing together. And that's where it gets a little bit, bit weird and difficult. That being said, this isn't actually a problem that arises from science. It's a problem that arises from the story itself, right? Regardless of your theory, then, this isn't a conflict between science and religion, per se. After all, if God merely specially created Adam and Eve, let's say they were the only two human-like creatures around, and there were no other humans seems difficult to see how their sons would find wives. Um, whatever difficulty then that arises, it comes from the story itself. It's not something that comes from the science. And so whatever theory you might adopt about how to solve this, it's, it's, it's a difficulty that we need to basically take account of just simply from the story, from the theological history. Science can add on to it and maybe give us some insight. Um, but at the end of the day, the conflict isn't one with science, with genetics, because even just reading the story without considering the biology, this same problem still arises. Um, so, again, maybe not an entirely satisfactory solution, but one that's at least workable in principle, uh, and one where we can see it's not actually a conflict between science and religion. It's, an, it's a dispute from basically within the camp of how to figure out and account for this story. So, 
those are the issues in biology. Very fast, very brief, kind of plunged in and then pulled back out again. But there we go. So what are some alleged or super co superficial conflicts in cosmology? By the way, if, you, if you've been watching the news, this is an image from the new James Webb telescope. So we have the Hubble telescope that's been in space for a while. This is a new telescope, a better telescope. And this is an image of Jupiter. Um, and you can see, first of all, there's actually like a bit of a ring around Jupiter, which we don't normally think of. But then on Earth, we have the, the aurora borealis, no, up in, up in the north. Uh, Jupiter has auroras too, in the north and in the south. So just thought that was kind of cool and neat, wanted to share that. Um, anyways, issues in cosmology. The Big Bang as conflicting with the Christian account of creation. Uh, and then another is that the universe is just too big, too old, too inhospitable to be made by God or for man. I'm not going to spend long on this one because the principles are pretty similar to the, one with, to the issue with evolution. Similar question. How do we square this account with Genesis? Well, if Genesis isn't intended to be a literal, historical, scientific account, then the issue doesn't really arise in the first place. Again, God can use secondary, intermediate causes to bring about his effect, included, including Big Bangs. So, just a thought there. Um, and likewise, if the big, big Bang caused the universe, does that mean God didn't? And again, no. God can use this instrument to bring about all of the rest of creation. So, again, won't dwell on it. If you can resolve the issues with evolution, you can resolve the issues with the Big Bang here. The same principles apply. Another issue, though, one that might require a little more thought is, you know, maybe the universe is just too big, too old, too inhospitable. So the charge is that yeah, the universe is just too large for humans to be important, right? I mean, just light years upon light years upon light years of empty space with planets that many probably don't have life on them, can't have life on them. You know, Earth is just this tiny little speck in all of space, and humans can only live on a you know, relatively small proportion of that Earth. How can we be the crowning pinnacle of God's creation when everything else is just so big? We seem so insignificant in comparison to the rest of it. So that's one charge. The second is that the universe is too old. You know, the universe is, what, 14.8 billion years old or something like that, almost 15? 14.2? I can't remember but over 14 billion years old. What's the point of God waiting 14 billion years before bringing humans into the picture? If, again, the point was to bring about humanity and redeem humanity through Christ. That's a long time to wait. Why would he do that? It doesn't seem like the universe is created for us. And then finally, the universe is largely inhospitable. It really isn't the kind of universe which would be made to support life. Again, you go almost anywhere else in this universe, you will not be able to live there. Most of it's empty space. A lot of it is you know, stars, maybe some planets or moons, but they don't have water. They don't, they don't have anything that can support a robust biological ecosystem. So again, we might be lucky here on Earth, but the universe doesn't really seem to be made for life, for living. So again, what's the point? So, just maybe some brief answers then. In regards to the first charge, can a large universe maybe just exist for its own sake, for the sake of our discovering it, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a secret that you know, we've been looking up at the stars for centuries. We find wonder and amazement in looking into space. And so, there might be something there for God created it for us to explore, to observe, to understand. Um, and maybe he just made it because he thinks it's awesome. Right? You know, again, Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God. Something that's so expansive, so amazing, so beautiful, speaks to his power and his glory. So the fact that the universe is so big, yeah, okay. So what? It's amazing. It's incredible. And something we can find incredible, and perhaps God finds beautiful as well. So no issues there. Now, the universe being too old, we'll get into this when we discuss God's nature a little bit, but God stands above and outside of time. 
he's not actually waiting 14 billion years to bring about human beings. He, he stands above the timeline. And so all of it is present to him at once. He isn't waiting. He, he's, and so there wasn't anything there you know, in the universe to wait. And since God isn't subject to time, it's not like he is just sitting, tapping his foot, looking at the clock. You know, it's like, all right, only eight and a half billion more years to go, and then we can get the show on the road. That's not how it works. Time is a creature. God is not. He is not subject to it. Third, the charge that the universe is inhospitable. Um, God didn't make the universe such that it could support life everywhere. That wasn't his goal. Again, something we can explore, something we can look into and find amazement in. But again, even if you just look at the earth, most of it we can't inhabit. Two-thirds of it is water, a bunch of it is ice or desert or, you know, really rough mountainous terrain. So, I mean, it's not quite the same proportions, but even if you just look at the world we live in, most of it is not hospitable. Um, so we shouldn't be too surprised to find the universe is kind of the same way as well. Uh, so it just kind of seems to be, a, again, a relative non-issue. So now let's start uh, turning these on their head. We've gone through some of the alleged conflicts and difficulties between biology, cosmology, and Christianity. Um, are there maybe any points where they actually tend in the direction of faith being true? So we'll look at a couple here. One, intelligent design. And this is actually a technical term relating to biology, to biological organisms that seem to be, that don't seem to have been able to arise from evolution, natural selection by themselves. And the second is what's called the evolutionary argument against naturalism. We'll get into that in a little bit. I won't explain it too much here. So are biological organisms designed? This gentleman here, his name is Michael Behe. He's a biochemist, um, and he's been one of the main figures in the intelligent design movement for many years. And his basic point is basically like, all right, if we accept neo-Darwinian evolution, so neo-Darwinism neo is basically evolution plus genetics melded together. If we accept neo-Darwinian evolution by natural selection, where certain mutations arise in genes by chance and are either selected or deselected, in terms of their adaptiveness, you know, what helps a, an organism survive in a certain environment, then there appear to be quite a few things we find in creatures, certain protein structures in cells, the human eye, bacterial flagella, these are, you know, flagella, it's like a tail, a motor on the back of certain bacteria that helps them move around. Um, these seem to have certain adaptations which are so improbable that they must have been designed rather than having arisen by chance. Um, so that, that's basically his claim, like, we can, we can in some ways gauge the likelihood of certain mutations arising. But some of these mutations, again, flagellum, protein structures, you'd need a whole bunch of very unlikely mutations to arise right at the same time, where we're talking like 1% likelihood is way, 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 way too high. We're talking like, like fractions of fractions of fractions of a percent. Um, that they could have arisen in, in this way, where, again, if we're just assuming that they're not designed, it's just natural selection, random mutation, bringing them about. Uh, and so, basically, this naturalistic theory of evolution runs into probability issues. We observe things that should not be possible, or at least which would be horribly improbable, if we, if we assume that evolution is true and there's no guiding process to it. That being said, there are some questions, right? Uh, Behe and others are pretty explicit. Like, this doesn't actually prove God, per se. It just proves that there's some designer. And so it could be the Christian God. It could be, heck, it could be aliens. Um, it could be some intelligent agent who brings this about. Uh, so it's not really a proof for God, even if it works. Um, but it might be suggestive. That being said, there are some even faithful Christians who have, who have reservations about this. Um, I myself might count as one of them. Uh, so the way, I mean, part of it is, it is really, really difficult to determine 
the likelihood of certain certain mutations, certain adaptations arising throughout history, um, and especially like these adaptations or these different functions might have had other uses and developed into into new ones. So take the bacterial flagellum, for example. Again, it's sort of like a tail on bacteria that's a motor, moves them around. Um, it couldn't, that tail probably couldn't have arisen by itself through random mutation unless there were some preceding things that existed beforehand to, that had a different function. And we actually find that a lot of these flagella they're hollow. They're like tubes, almost. And what we think might have happened is they were actually pumps to sort of like get bacteria out of the, out of the organism. And so it was, initially something, it was initially something that was used to like excrete things from the, from the system. And then, only, and then it later developed, it got longer and longer, and then it eventually turned into a tail that could move it. Uh, and so... Basically, the flagellum, the motor, the tail, whatever you want to call it, didn't arise randomly. It arose because previous stages were already adaptive, were already helpful, were already useful to the organism, and then it just turned into something else right at the very end. Um, so things like that where we can actually begin to sort of explain away and understand certain evolutionary adaptations. Another criticism, though, that's often leveled by by even faithful Christians is, again, this turns God into a bit of a tinkerer, where he's having to, like, fine-tune fine these little organisms, you know, he's pushing molecules together to make stuff happen, and it doesn't, it doesn't give natural organisms enough room to really be what they're supposed to be. And so it, it ends up actually being a problematic theological picture, because it makes God, who's supposedly, you know, all-powerful, all-knowing, it makes him design things and then constantly be having to sort of go back to the drawing board and redesign them throughout history in order to get them to be what they're supposed to be. Um, and so there are certain issues here that sort of remain up in the air and unresolved. But some still consider this to be evolu or evidence that certain biological processes actually point to God rather than away from him. All right, so on to the... It's called the evolutionary argument against naturalism. So the basic question is this. Can naturalistic evolution account for our ability to know things? And the argument basically says no. Um, so here's how it goes. Let, let's assume for the sake of argument that evolution and naturalism are both true. Again, naturalism just being the belief that the natural world is all that is. There is no God. There are no divine beings making things happen. So if evolution and naturalism are both true, then our cognitive faculties, our minds, are the things we use to, to know the world, they evolve so as to provide primarily fitness for survival, which isn't the same as evolved to know the truth. And we'll get into that a little bit. If our cognitive faculties evolve so as to provide primarily fitness for survival, then they're not reliable at achieving truth, at least not necessarily. If our cognitive faculties are not reliable at achieving truth, then general skepticism is true. General skepticism is basically just like, well, I can't know anything. N not just I can't know difficult things. I can't know that there's actually a table in front of me, that any of you are real, any of that stuff. Because I can't trust my senses. I can't trust my thinking. It's all just a process of evolution and not something that is guided by reason. We don't want to go there. We're, I, I think we'd all agree that general skepticism is not true. We can know things, right? Um, that's pretty apparent. And so that means the initial assumption uh, that evolution and naturalism are both true, that initial assumption is false. So either evolution is false or naturalism is false, basically. Uh, and evolution is often used to prop up naturalism anyway. So basically, naturalism is false. Uh, okay, well, why would anyone believe this argument? What's... What's the point? Um, so, again, just the first premise is just an assumption, so we'll, we'll just stick with it for now. Um, and again, so the second premise, again, we evolve things so that we, uh, you know, creatures are more adapted for survival. That they're better adapted to the conditions they're in such that they can survive, pass along their genes, etc. So tr true just sort of falls out from our understanding of what evolution by natural selection is. 
Three is the contentious one. The, the third premise is the one that most might disagree with. I want to give some examples, though, that sort of gesture in this direction. Let's go back to evolutionary psychology. And so evolutionary psychology, again, says religion arose not because man is detecting God, but because it was just this social cohesion thing, this, this thing that came along with evolution. But it's, it's an example of something where evolution is giving us this sort of belief system that, at least on naturalism, isn't true, right? And so, at least for these big picture questions, evolutionary psychology would actually seem to agree with the third premise, that there are major instances where we believe things not because they're true, not because we're tracking with what is true, but because that's just what evolution programmed into us. A second example. Major, uh, some major proponents of, of you know, just natural evolutionary theories say that morality, our sense of right and wrong, our conscience, those are also just sort of programmed into us on an evolutionary basis. Our sense of right and wrong doesn't actually, there, there is no actual right and wrong, right? It's just something that is, you know, having a, a morality is useful for surviving because otherwise we're you know, getting into fights with people and you know, killing off our children and doing bad things like that that prevent us from being adapted and fit for our environment and passing along our genes. So that would be another area where, again, if evolution and naturalism are both true, we can see that morality is actually just a fiction, a figment of our imagination. It isn't true. Um, there's even just like basic things in our wiring with perception, like that we, we don't perceive, like our, our brain has to take in the sensory information and put it all together, but it's not entirely accurate, right? It, it's things that help us survive. So again, if you, you know, you know someone like jumps out, startles you, you, know, you, you reflexively, like you jump, you, you move back. And it's not because they're an actual threat, it's because you're programmed to react defensively to something that might not be a threat, right? Better safe than sorry on an, on an evolutionary point of view. And so we see all these examples build up where if both evolution is true and naturalism is true, we end up with all these illusionary false beliefs. Well, if that's the case, how are we actually able, supposed to be able to do science if we can't even do basic, if our basic moral reasoning is right? Like, science gets incredibly difficult, incredibly abstract, often can get very removed from our immediate experience. If these basic things like, again, morality, religion, are all just false programming that evolution gives to us, how can we trust any major thinking we do in science or just broad philosophizing or things like that. So that's the basic gist of the argument. If evolution is true and there's no natural there's no guiding process, then we're not our, our minds actually aren't evolved to understand what's true. They're just under they're evolved to survive and that's it. But then again that makes science, that makes philosophy basically impossible. Um, and so yeah, and if science is impossible then we don't have any good reason to think evolution is true. So, so it's basically a self-undermining position, right? Um, that's the basic, the basic gist of it. So we've got this little diagram here. I believe naturalism is true, but I'm also a product of evolutionary naturalism alone. And my beliefs are programmed into me to help me survive, not to track the truth, including the belief that naturalism is true. And then we just go around the circle. So basically, we end up in a position where we, we cut the chair, the legs of the chair that we're sitting on. Um, if we're assuming that evolution and naturalism are both true. So, all right. That's the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Long story short, if evolution's true and there's no God or designer to guide it, then we can't actually trust our own reasoning processes, our ability to track the truth. That's the basic gist of the argument. All right, so let's turn now to cosmology uh, and turning this on its head. So, the origins of the universe. This can speak against naturalism. Also, what we call the fine-tuning of the universe can be an argument against naturalism. So let's look at the beginning of the universe, creation. 
So again, the Big Bang Theory. It's sort of the standard theory of cosmic origins, of how we all got here, of how space came to be what it is. Uh, the term Big Bang was actually it was a derogatory epithet by the British and atheist physicist Fred Hoyle. Um, so it, it was meant to be not a compliment, but he called it that precisely because Big Bang sounded a little too much like some kind of act of creation. Um, the name stuck, but uh, yeah, initially, I mean, it was recognized by those in the community, even at the time, like, this smacks of some special act of creation, you know. Oh, I guess the, un the universe didn't exist for, for forever, passed into eternity. It must have come about at some point. Okay, that might be an issue. So the basic gist is it indicates a past boundary in time. There's a point at which you know, all of space, all of time was you know, condensed into this, this you know, incredibly dense, hot single state called a singularity, um, at least in math. That's what the math turns into. Uh, we don't entirely know what happened in the very, very first, you know, few like seconds, moments after the Big Bang, because um, our theories of physics sort of break down there. But the direction it's pointing in is it just sort of came into being from nothing. Um, there's also this theorem called the bohr guth vilenkin theorem. Maybe you've heard of it, uh, but basically it argues that. Any, so any model of the universe um, that physicists can make, if it's, if it's at least on average expanding, which most of these models are, um, at least most of the workable models, if it's expanding on average, then it must have had a beginning at some point. It must have had a, a boundary in the past which it can't go, can't go beyond. Um, so these all basically seem indicative of, okay, the universe began. At some point, it didn't just—it wasn't just around existing for forever. Uh, and if the universe began, then kind of leads to the question: like, okay, where did it come from? It seems to imply some cause, but indeed a cause that's outside of space and time, and which has the intelligence and power to produce such a, an expansive but also intelligible universe. Right? We can study it; it has laws. We can study it with math, with physics. It's not just random chaos. It's well ordered and structured. And so whatever cause brought it about, again, must be incredibly powerful, seems to be very intelligent, and you know, stands outside of space, time, is immaterial. What does that start to sound like? It starts to sound like God, right? Um, and maybe it's not like completely knocked down where every literal possible alternative is ruled out, at least right on these grounds. But again, it's incredibly suggestive. So, beginning of the universe. Let's talk about fine-tuning. Um, this is another topic that gets pretty complicated, and I'm just going to skim it, but the basic premise is this. There are certain facts about our universe which are surprising. So, for example, the rate at which our universe is, is expanding, it's perfectly suited for developing stable stars. And stars, in turn, give rise to heavier elements. They explode, and then you get you know, things like you know, maybe like iron or something like that. You can start forming planets. You can start having planets that have developed, you no, know, developed worlds such you can have a biological ecosystem there. So if you don't have stars, you don't have anything else. Is the basic is a basic point. Um, but the rate at which the universe is expanding, if it expands too fast, all of the matter, all of the energy, just gets dispersed out into space, um, and you don't have any stars forming. If you don't have any stars, you don't have any planets, you don't have any biology, you don't have any chemistry, you don't have any life at all. However, if, it was, if the rate of expansion was slower, uh, the universe, you know, because it's extremely tight and dense, there's a lot of gravity there, right? You know, gravity is just things pulling on each other. Well, if all of these things are very near to each other, their tendency is just going to be to clump up. And so if the universe expands too slowly, the Big Bang happens, and then it immediately collapses back in on itself. And again, you get no stars, no chemistry, no life, no space, no time, no anything. Um, so that's not life. Uh, and like the, the rate of expansion of the universe, it sits on the edge of a knife. Like If you change it even the tiniest amount, 
again, fraction of a 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 percent is way, 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 way too high. Um, if you change it even the tiniest amount, it will either expand too fast and you won't have stars, or it'll expand too slow. Um, so that's just one factor where, okay, we shouldn't have a universe with stars or chemistry or life in it because it should have either blown apart or collapsed back again. Um, but then there's also other parameters. So the ratio between the masses of fundamental particles like the electron, the pro proton, the neutron, if you know, one were maybe a little heavier, a little lighter relative to the others, you also would not have chemistry and thus life. Um, so this ratio is extremely fine-tuned. How much so? So take this diagram, this picture here. Um, so let's say this, this big box right here, you know, the technical term, it, it's a probability space. So basically, this is, these are the possible universes that our theories of physics allows. And then the dark space here is a possible span of universes that uh, permit life, that have, again, chemistry, stars, all of those things. And actually, this is the second, there was a series of diagrams here, I couldn't find the last picture, so it's carved down even more from this. So the way the author has described it is, take this whole probability space, this big box, and then take this range of life permitting universes. This is not to scale. It is absolutely not to scale. And what they say is, this life permitting area is in this vast sea of non-life permitting universes. Um, where, say that, so this, again, this dark section, let's say we shrunk it down to be just, just barely visible to the naked eye um, within, this, within this space here. And then we needed to grow this square, this probability space, it wouldn't just be as big as this laptop. It wouldn't be as big as this room. It wouldn't be as big as the state or country or world. This probability space would be 10 light years high, 10 light years in each direction of the square. Uh, so, so this box is basically, yeah, 10 light years in every direction. And the, the space of life permitting universes within that 10 light year box, just visible to the naked eye. That's what it would be if we had this to scale. Um, so, so again, think of the space, let's say you put a golf ball somewhere in, you know, U.S. Bank Stadium. Um, and the entire volume of U.S. Bank Stadium is life permitting universes. And or is, is the you know, potential universes our theory allows. And the life permitting range is just the golf ball. Golf ball is pretty small relative to US Bank Stadium. But that doesn't come even close to describing the, the low likelihood that we could have the universe we do with, again, chemistry, stars, life, simply based upon the ratios of the quarks, electrons, whatever. Um, Basically, the long story short, to not belabor the point, long story short is that we shouldn't exist. There shouldn't be any life whatsoever in our universe at all, precisely because if you changed any of this even a little bit, you would end up in a universe that cannot sustain life. And again, there are several other parameters like this as well. So basically, the probability is practically zero that we would exist given, given the range that all of these, these values, these laws of nature could take. And yet we do exist. There is life. And so it seems it, it can't just be an accident. The probability is so, so tiny that it was an accident that it seems to indicate that there, there was, again, someone, someone ordering things such that we could exist. So basically... The universe shouldn't support life. The fact that it does seems to imply that there's some kind of provident designer. Quick note on multiverse theories before we wrap up. Um, so some people try to explain away both the beginning of the universe and its fine-tuning by appealing to multiverses. Multiverse is just like, we've got our universe, 
but then there's a whole bunch of other universes. There's like an infinite universe generator, and we're just one among many, many, many universes. And so one that would seem to maybe imply that there isn't actually, our universe might have a beginning, but maybe the big multiverse doesn't. Maybe it's existed forever. Um, it's also a problem for fine tuning in as much as if there are effectively an infinite number of universes coming off of this multiverse, then all of a sudden there, there, should, there will eventually arise some universe that can support life simply as a matter of sheer probability. Um, so that would seem to explain away then fine-tuning and all of those things as well. Issue with multiverses. One, many of these multiverse models are more proof-of-concept models. They're toy models. They're not rigorously laid out such that it's like, oh, this is an actual workable model of a multiverse. We, we just don't really have those. Um, part of it is just because they'd be so remote and they're, no, you, can't really, you can't experiment on another universe, right? Um, but most of these multiverse theories aren't serious enough to be like, oh, this has to be true. Um, they're just, again, toy models. But second, even among these models, it's difficult to avoid fine-tuning and a cosmological beginning for a substantial portion of them. So there's this, uh, there's this physicist named Luke Barnes, and he basically put it this way. A model is basically just a mathematical description of how either like the universe or multiverse might be. And if you look at all the models of the universe or multiverse on the market, if you, if, you pull, if you pull them, as he says, the vast majority of them would say, yeah, there's a beginning even to the multiverse, and yeah, this multiverse even has fine-tuning of its own. And so you really don't escape the problem by appealing to multiverses to get out of it. It's, it's just not, it's not a, at least at present, a viable alternative. Um, even if multiverse theory is true, most likely it doesn't avoid the problems listed above. So, at the end of the day, it can't be used to shut down the argument. Okay, deep breath. So, to sum it all up, as we saw last week, Christianity has historically been in a largely positive relationship with science. Here today we can see that supposed conflicts between science and Christianity are not really that substantial, and in fact, Christianity might stack up better than naturalism when all of the science is taken into account. So in sum, Christianity and science are not in conflict and can rather be seen to be allies with each other in many respects. So again, we take this, this thesis that faith and reason, science and religion are in conflict. It's simply not true. It's not. And when you actually examine the evidence, that becomes pretty apparent. Again, it's this cultural myth, this received wisdom that just has no grounding in reality whatsoever. So, science and religion, science and Christianity, allies in the end, not enemies. <coughs> Coming up next, not next week, two weeks from now, uh, moving out of questions relating to science, faith, and reason in and of themselves, and we will be beginning to discuss arguments for the existence of God. Those will be fun, I think. I think that would just be one where we can just sit down, hash it out, see how it all comes together. So, yeah, something to look forward to for all of you. But that basically concludes this presentation. I realize I haven't really given room for any questions throughout, in large part because I wasn't sure I'd be able to get through this if I stopped several times. So, after all of that... Any questions or comments? We can go back to we can go back to certain things too if you'd like. Uh, so, Father. Yes. Um, another thing with the fine tuning, you know, for the Earth to support life, isn't it true that even the axis has to be a certain tilt of the Earth, and if it's not that exact precise tilt, we wouldn't have daylight life either. Yeah. So the common question being like I mean even our earth seems to be sort of fine-tuned for life where the the our axis the tilt of the earth towards the sun seems really kind of ideal for supporting life in a way that other planets wouldn't have and I guess my response to that would be the earth might be in some ways ideal what does become an issue is because there are so many planets in well, in the galaxy in the universe 
uh, you'll eventually find some that are, you know, that do have the right tilt and that would, you know, be able to support water and things like that. Um, and so Earth is special, but given how many planets there are, we should expect to find some special planets. So that wouldn't be too surprising. Um, well, so. if there was life on other planets, I'm kind of hoping we're the only ones. <laughs> but, but if there's life on other planets, would, would there have been a testing period, like, like with Adam and Eve, where they would have needed a redeemer? Yeah, so question being, if there were life on other planets, would they have had a testing period? Would they have needed a redeemer? The answer is, beats me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the... It wouldn't be surprising. I mean, even, even the angels had their own testing period of a sort, even if it was just an instantaneous decision, either for or against God. Um, so I would say that seems to be the way God does things from the very small sample size we have. Um, but what that would have been, how it would have looked, maybe they would have succeeded. Who knows? Um, if you read C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, that takes up that very question. You know, find a race of unfallen creatures and what that all looks like. Yeah. <laughs> um, usually a, a person pulls up apologetics when they're speaking to a non-Christian or a non-believer and the science comparison or story of science with this doesn't I don't know put much attention on just the plain glory of God. And so if you are trying to lead this non-believer to believing, it seems like you're missing something. You know what I mean? Is that kind of clear? Yeah, so the comment being, you know, if you're talking with someone who's a non-believer, maybe atheist, agnostic, whatever, you're presenting the scientific case for you know, the reasonability of Christian belief, belief in God, things like that, it doesn't really speak much to God's glory by itself, to who God is, or even to you know, the redemption of Christ, all these things. So it, it seems something's incomplete, basically seems to be the comment. Um, and I guess my thoughts on the matter is, it is incomplete. Uh, evangelization cannot consist of apologetics by itself. It, it simply can't. Um, you need to, I mean, it, you, know, you need to meet a person where they're at. So if they have intellectual difficulties, they do need to be dealt with. But apologetics mostly just tries to get rid of the intellectual difficulties. It's not something that can often function as like a standalone, standalone thing whereby someone's brought into, into faith and in relationship with Christ. There are a few people for whom that is the case. Um, it does happen. It's fairly infrequent, relatively speaking. Um, and so, you know, being able to just demonstrate, like, you know, if we were all the best apologists in the world but were horribly morally corrupt and not very nice people, that would probably be a lot more detrimental to the faith than if we just didn't know anything but were nice and pleasant to everybody. Uh, so there is... There's a lot more to an evangelical witness and to bring someone into the faith than merely the arguments. There has to be. Um, so, you know, Christ said, you know, he who loves me will do my commands, do my commandments. Uh, it's not merely a matter of arguing with people. It's being faithful to Christ uh, and demonstrating you know, his love and his vision for the world. So probably 30 years ago, I said when I was studying human evolution in college, uh, before my reversion, um, and probably the biggest objection that I could come up with, unguided evolution back since then, I'll say, and I haven't studied it much since, so maybe you're more familiar with something more current than 30 years ago. But um, probably the biggest objection, and I didn't hear you really touch on it, so I'm curious if you have any thoughts on it, was even if, um, like talking about the flagellum, even mm -hmm. if the bacterial flagellum originated with some other function uh, through a process of random mutation, that mutation has to out-reproduce 
all the all the other unmutated organisms that are that same species. And if there's only one random mutation, how does it outreproduce the entire population of the other bacteria? Uh, and make and become the universal instead of just a random mutation, the universal trait. Mm -hmm. um, and I was shocked after my undergraduate years, many years later, to find out that we never talked about that, studying evolution, because I don't think there's an answer to how that happens. It came to mind because you also mentioned that people talk in genetics about that there couldn't have been a point at which there were fewer than 10,000 humans. Just think about that for a second. How does that make sense? Where did the 9,998 come from, if not from an original pair that had to somehow out-reproduce all the other human-like creatures that existed at that time? Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Let's see if I can summarize the questions for our recorder here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, my under so, as I understand it, the first question dealing with, you know, in particular, bacterial flagellum, it's not just enough that you have this random mutation that turns out to be, you know, in just one creature, but that that mutation has to end up basically dominating where, you know, reproductively, eventually every other organism like it ends up having that mutation. Um, and so with respect to the, you know, bacterial flagellum and maybe the, you know, bacterial excretion pipe, as it were, that could have preceded it. Even were that the case, how do you get that that mutation to be present in all of the in all of these you know, all of these creatures rather than just in the one before it dies and that's the end? Um, I don't have a great answer there. So I mean that, that might be something that might be one of the frontiers to push in on here because I mean there have been millions and millions and millions of words of ink spilled on the question of intelligent design in particular examples. And I frankly, I don't know that much about it. That's been one of the lesser interests in the science and religion debates for me. So I don't have a good answer to it. Um, anyone who wants to look into it, I'd encourage you to do so and get back to me. Uh, and then with respect to the question on population genetics of, all right, how, how can we end up with no fewer than 10,000 humans at a given time? You know, where do the, again, where do the other 9,998 come from, if not from some, some first pair? Um, and I think that's also an interesting contested question, because where do you draw the line on, on what a human is, is, first of all, at least on a biological level? One of the things that you often find in discussions of you know, biology, Darwinian evolution, is that Species, while we speak of species, they're not really discrete different things. I mean, it's, they're sort of a continuum species, right? And so where, at what point do you get enough, at what point do you have an, the right genetic makeup such that you're a human, whereas, no, the generation previous wasn't, um, and then determine from there how many humans exist at any given time? Again, I have no idea. Um, and so... That would be another question where might be might be further questions to ask. And like I said, this was a survey, and I don't have all the answers, not even close. So uh, I encourage further inquiry in these matters, but I don't actually have an answer myself. Could it be that um, when the Bible says um, about the creation of Adam and then Eve, you know, from his rooms, whatever, but that's probably just, you know, like, you know, but... Um, could it be that when the Bible says that God breathed, you know, he breathed into the nostrils of something like Adam, you know, but that's probably just a way of saying it. So when, when he breathed into him, that gave him life, and that's where the soul entered into this evolutionary system? So the question being, all right, it speaks when, when God created Adam in Scripture, it speaks of him you know, breathing into him, breathing life into him, and, like, Maybe that is a point at which, like, rational soul entered into him and entered into the human human timeline, the chain. Um, that doesn't seem unreasonable to me. Obviously, we can't make definitive judgments, but I think that's about as good a case as can be made for any any given any given point at which the rational human soul entered the picture. Doesn't this indicate that the Bible? 
scripture doesn't do everything. I mean, like Jesus made many more miracles than it's written, and um, it's just not recorded. And there are other mysteries that we really can't explain, uh, like the virginity of um, Mary after having a child. So these mysteries remain as a secret, and God tells us that what in heaven, you know, these secrets, these mysteries will be revealed. So he's relying on us to have faith for the things we can't explain, and use it as a mystery and secret. So for the listeners question being all right i mean we hear in scripture about how again there were many great works jesus performed that weren't recorded here and there are certain mysteries again the perpetual virginity of mary even after childbirth where it's not really explained or cashed out and yet the lord's asking us to believe these in faith still even if we don't have a full explanation of it Um, and that seems to me to be exactly right where the lord gives us enough light to See, be able to see that he's he's trustworthy, um, but enough darkness where we can act, we actually can have faith in him, and faith is meritorious. It's something that helps us grow in righteousness, uh, and you know, our glory in heaven will be greater in virtue of it. Um, and so, God gives us enough light to be able to see to, that we can trust him. But then there are certain mysteries, again, perpetual virginity of Mary, Trinity, incarnation, things like that, where. We won't find out until heaven, or even in heaven, we might not really ultimately pierce the depths of it all. Maybe he's asking us not to be so nosy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Might be asking us to be uh, trusting, and then, you know, we should should try to, again, pierce the mysteries as best we're able, um, but recognize our limits as well. It's a both-and thing. Any final thoughts or questions before we wrap up? All right, so next, next apologetic session will be on Monday the 12th of September. So we'll be discussing arguments for the existence of God then. Looking forward to seeing you all there. Let's finish with the glory be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.